Every year, thousands of experts evaluate the status of animal, plant, algae, and fungi species around the world. Using a common language of assessment, they categorize each species' risk of extinction on the IUCN Red List. The Red List provides a barometer of life. And every year, the outlook gets worse. More than 31,000 species are currently threatened with extinction. Most because of human action. But human action can also reverse the Red List trend. So conservationists, governments, and communities around the world are joining forces, activating tried and tested IUCN tools in a coordinated effort to assess, plan, and act for wildlife. Together, we can save species from extinction. Together, we can win the fight for our planet's future. Together, we can reverse the red. Welcome everybody to our third Reverse the Red webinar, where we're going to continue to explore the really tricky question of our time how do we reverse the trends for so many species that we see tipping always closer and closer to extinction? I'm Jenny Gray. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Zoos Victoria and the immediate past president of the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And I'd like to open by paying my respect to the traditional owners on the land, of the land from which I'm joining you, the people of the Wurundjeri nation, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to elders past and present. The red listing of species is a process whereby we use a common language, a common language to talk about how well species are doing. And we rank them from least concern right through to extinct. And it really gives us a language where we can express concern quickly. We don't need to explain what we mean when we say a species is extinct or least concern. And what we do know is that for many species, the situation is getting worse, if we might even say catastrophic. And so today we are going to have a panel discussion and I'm joined with the most incredible panel of people. Um, I'm delighted to have you all joining us and I'm really looking forward to seeing where this conversation goes. The format of the conversation is a, a fireside chat. Um, and along the way, we're going to be encouraging um, you, the audience, to join in, to give us your opinions on some of these questions and to share with us your thoughts. I'd like to start also with a quote from um, a hero of mine and of many people, the wonderful Nelson Mandela. He says, I dream of our vast deserts, of our forests and all our great wilderness. We must never forget that it is our duty to protect this environment. It's my pleasure to introduce five women who never forget this call, the call of vast deserts and wildernesses. And as I introduce you to them, I'm gonna tell you where they come from. And I'd love you, the audience, just to tell us where you're coming from. So please jump onto the chat and tell us where you are. I can see from my text messages, I have friends from around the world um, who are joining us tonight. And so the panel that is my great pleasure to introduce from the UAE, we have Razan al Mubarak. Razan is the Managing Director of the Environment Agency in Abu Dhabi. In 2018, in the World Economic Forum, selected her as one of the top 100 young global leaders for her contribution to building a more sustainable future for humankind. Razan is an IUCN presidential candidate. From Sri Lanka, we have Asha Defoss. 
Asha is a marine biologist, ocean educator, and a pioneer of blue whale research within the Northern Indian Ocean. She is the founder and director of the not-for-profit Ocean Swell, Sri Lanka's first marine conservation research and education organization. And Asha believes that the health and future of coastlines depends on how we engage with local people. From California, Chris Tompkins joins us. Chris is the former CEO of Patagonia and a formidable conservationist. She has enabled the protection of millions of acres of habitat and parks in Chile and Argentina, creating homes for megafauna. She is the president and co-founder of Tompkins Conservation and was named the UN Environment Patron of Protected Areas since 2018. Yolanda Kaka. Badasi, I'm sorry, I'm terrible with surnames. Yolanda is served as the Minister of Environment for Ecuador with the United Nations Conference for Environment and Development and is a former president of the IUCN and former president of WWF International. And today Yolanda is joining us all the way from Galapagos. Welcome Yolanda. And finally from Canada via Tanzania, I would say as well, Elizabeth Marama, Maruma Marema. Elizabeth is the Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Elizabeth has worked with the UN, UN Environment Program for over two decades and was the Director of the Law Division at UNEP, which is also responsible for international environmental governance as well as multilateral environment agreements. Um, you'll agree with me what a remarkable group of people and I am so looking forward to the conversation we are now going to join into. In preparation, we asked our panel about their favorite species and they each have a slightly different take on this, which I think is going to be quite delightful. And you, the audience, if you look in the chat box, you'll see there's a Mentimeter link. We're asking you, what are the species you would miss? What are the ones that would be such a great tragedy if we never got to see them again? And so we'll come back and watch what you've been putting in, but I'm going to start straight away by handing over to Razan. And Razan, you have chosen a particularly beautiful little species. Tell us a little bit about them. Sorry, you're on mute. You're going to have to unmute. Sorry about that. Um, Jenny, I was uh, saying that it's sometimes hard to explain why you love something, but uh, sometimes you can pinpoint perhaps to moments uh, when you fell in love. And for me, I fell in love with this uh, species when I was working on understanding its migratory, migratory migration routes all around the world. And I was struck completely by the breadth of its, its range. Um, again, I, there were moments, other moments where I fell in love with this animal. I fell in love with this animal again when I was working on releasing uh, the, uh, a peregrine falcon on the steppes of Kazakhstan. I also fell in love with this animal many, many times over when I'm sitting around the fire in, in Arabia, listening to this beautiful Nabati poetry that was very much inspired by the species. So for these reasons, I'm very, very, very much select this, this animal as my favorite. But of course, as you may know, this animal is one of the, is the fastest animal on, on the planet. And because we're a all female uh, crew here, I have to say that actually, the female um, um, falcon, peregrine falcon, is the fastest, is the strongest, and has the most endurance. <laughs> and I'll stop there. That's wonderful, Roseanne. What a great totem for us for tonight. Um, Yolanda, you chose a frog species to share with us today. Yes. Um, you know, you know. Actually, I had a difficult time in um, in telling you that it was the frog. It is one of my favorite species, and I love it because I love the song when water comes back, when it starts raining, 
when the grass is, uh, is wet, when um, the early, mm, the, the, the sun sets and the early dusk comes along. And in the very morning when it starts to sing to let you know that the world is alive, and, and that is beautiful. But as I said, it, my confession is that I would love to be a hummingbird. I would love to be a dolphin or a, or a caballo de mar, an ocean, a, a seahorse. Is that the right term? Um, and and uh, every ecosystem has some very special animal that uh, attracts all my attention wherever I am. And now that I'm in the Galapagos, it's even worse. <laughs> Over. Uh, what a wonderful description of, of how species just suck us into an environment. Yeah. Elizabeth, you're taking us to Africa and to one of the top predators. Indeed, as you can see in the picture, the leopard, I love uh, the decorative uh, and beautiful colors of that body. Its shyness is it's not very easy, even when you go to national parks to be able to see it. If you have seen it, you remember how it works so majestically. It's indeed a fascinating species. But uh, leopard also in always solitary, reclusive species of a big cat, almost widespread, extending from Africa, Asia, from the Middle East to the Pacific Ocean. Unfortunately and sadly, it is currently classified as vulnerable in the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. And unfortunately, its population continues to decrease. And while leopard is the most resilient, adaptable of the big cats, it has seen its historic range of decline of up to 7% in Africa, 87% in Asia, due to no small part to pressures exerted by us, mainly rapidly expanding human population. This has contributed to the extinction of leopards in 23 of its 85 original range uh, countries. Very sad. Regrettably, the key threats to its survival are still ongoing. And these include habitat loss and fragmentation, uh, prey depletion, human animal conflict, unsustainable trophy hunting, poaching of the leopard uh, body parts, indiscriminate killing, killings, and the list goes on. So I love it, but sadly, I'm seeing it getting extinct or decreased in, my, in front of my eyes. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. What a timely reminder of just how close it is to lose them. Now, Asha, we would all be surprised if you weren't taking us under the ocean, but you are taking us under the ocean and that's why we've got marine biologists with us. Asha, share with us your, your first love here. Sorry, you're on mute, you just, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so I, um, for me, it's the blue whale um, for very many reasons, but the top reason is because my career kickstarted was kickstarted when I actually saw an aggregation of blue whales and a floating pile of whale poop off the southern coast of Sri Lanka. Not everyone can say that Eureka moment started with a pile of poop. So I have, I'm eternally grateful to this species for that encounter that really changed my life. Um, slightly unusual story, but um, also, you know, like, you know, to me, I think we're so privileged because we get to live on this planet side by side with the largest animal that has ever roamed. And every time I'm out there on the water, surrounded by these animals, I just almost have to pinch myself, you know, and remind myself that that's the case. Like what a privilege for us today to be here and we can sit out there and watch these giants um, with their elusive lives. And we still know so little about them. And that's the, also a point, right? They're so big, yet we know just a tiny, tiny fraction of what goes on in their lives. 
I mean, they also have incredibly beautiful uh, red poop. Um, if you've never seen it, I would encourage all of you afterwards to Google it. It is bright red in color and it's definitely the most beautiful poop in the animal kingdom. So if you want to challenge me, all good, just send me a, an email or a sample. And um, I also think that, you know, we undervalue these species and they're a flagship species for the oceans because you know a lot of people gravitate to large animals like this and they allow me to then start up a conversation about the other smaller things that people tend to overlook in the ocean so uh the blue whale is uh, to me an incredibly magical species and i'm really privileged to uh dedicate my life to work with them Thank you. That's just wonderful. I, I'm a, a fairly avid scuba diver and have spent quite a lot of time around humpbacks. And do you remember a group of people when a humpback surfaced near us and then sprayed snot all over us, just being delighted that we were covered in whale snot? Um, maybe that just says something about us as people. Uh, Chris, I'm coming to you and you were challenged by our question. Um, and I think like lots of us found it difficult. <clears throat> Yes, and I think the the question of having a favorite is made all the more different, uh, excuse me, difficult once we began rewilding species that had become extirpated where we're working in Chile and Argentina. So yes, in some ways, this is the easy way out. And I will just say it's impossible for me to have a favorite once you, well, maybe this was always the case, but once you start working with jaguars and giant anteaters and um, lesser rayas and way more deer and chili, it's impossible to um, look at all life in the same way one might have decades ago. So I don't have a favorite or they're all my favorite. <laughs> I, I think that's so true. I find myself just being frivolous. So I have a favorite for this week and it might be different next week. Um, but wow, that was amazing. And perhaps we can get a slide up that just shows us what the audience thought. And what I've found amongst these discussions as we've had that so far, none of our panelists have even gone close to the same species. And have a look at that wonderful diversity of life that we're talking about, symbiotic fungi, lady beetles, reindeer, it, it's just, it's such, that's the, the joy of this planet is the, the diversity of species from, again, thresher sharks. I think we've got a lot of new animals. Um, and, and Elizabeth, you clearly did a great job on the African big cats that the African lion came out so strongly in the middle of that little discussion. Um, but what a wonderful, I, I love this exercise of just asking people um, about the, the, the species they love, because it really does show us how many different species need our help and protection. Um, this is not a simple exercise where we can pick one favorite and it'll be that, not that that even would be easy to do. Um, and so when we talk about our favorites, what we also showed on this list is how the red listing is going and how these species are going. And we had a lovely range. We had animals that were threatened, but also animals that are doing all right. And that's the reality is that there isn't just a single situation. There is an entire distribution of how species are going. The recently released Global Biodiversity Outlook, and Elizabeth, I know I'm in your territory when I speak about some of these, these facts. They showed that the red list has deteriorated 9% over the last 10 years. This is the decade of biodiversity. This is when we all committed to do our best to turn the trend around, and yet it still got worse by 9%. And over the weekend, I spent some time watching David Attenborough's latest show called Extinction, and it was a horribly sobering presentation of, in one place, all the things we know to be true that we are working with all the time. And so, the question we have is that conservation is not working. Despite the best efforts for many decades of many incredible people, we see that we're not succeeding. We see that we're going backwards. And so the question I'd like to ask everyone is, what's going wrong? Why isn't it working? And, and I'm going to start this time with Asher to say, 
what what do you think we're missing and again the audience there is a mentee link and we'd love to get your inputs we are consolidating all of these views as we go and through these webinars but Asha, what do you think's going wrong um, that's a great question that's always on every conservationist mind. I did look back at some of the answers from the previous two panels, and they covered a lot of what I think about, uh, you know, daily and kind of try to work through. But one of the other things that I think I didn't really see reflected um, in the previous week's answers was, um, I think part of the problem is that we look at species and we put blanket protection on, on them. So we'll look at blue whales. And for example, you know, with the red list, if you look at the status, it's they're endangered, but they're increasing. Um, that's looking at blue whales across the board. And in reality, within that, you know, the Belenoptera musculus, for example, there are subpopulations that have very different adaptations. Uh, very different conservation needs and that need to be in addressed individually. So overall, you know, we can't have one rule to protect all these populations. So for example, let me just say like in Sri Lanka, right? Like, you know, when you Google what do blue whales eat, um, air, on Wikipedia, it'll say krill, right? But the work we've done show that the blue whales out here feed on a type of suggested shrimp um, that, you know, is a little different. And so, this blue whale is adapted to feed on something different. So we can't use the same protection measures we use everywhere else on this population. And I think sometimes that's the problem. We bunch them all up together. We give this blanket protection and we're not actually addressing the individual population level needs that can help to actually protect the species and ensure that they survive into the long term. And so that uh, means we're also overlooking the work that's happening on the local level um, by, you know, sort of like kind of like all, putting it in an all encompassing category or box. And I don't think that does us any favors. And I think we do need to start looking. I mean, I, I, the population I work with will be listed as data deficient, right? Um, so how does that uh, get reflected in sort of the red list, for example? So I think really looking at um, trying to move away from blanket protection, but really concentrating on what are the needs of that population in that particular place based on that lifestyle and adaptation. That's what we need to be thinking about. Thank you, that's a, that's a great insight. Elizabeth, in terms of thinking of this question of what's not working, how, how do you think about the, the challenge that we have? Thank you, Jenny. Personally, for me, first, I will not say that species conservation is not working at global level. Our fifth global biodiversity outlook has clearly indicated where conservation measures have been undertaken. They've made a difference. They've even reduced the number of species going to extinction. But of course, our global report also has shown that while most of the measures have taken place and actions have taken place at national level, they had not been aligned with global targets. And that's why when you look at the picture at the global level, it sounds gloomer more than when you look at the same picture at what has happened at national level and the changes which have taken place as the result of conservation measures. Our global outlook report has shown 30% of forest deforestation has improved, has shown uh, alien invasive species have improved, particularly in the islands. So where conservation measures have taken place, things have improved. However, clearly it indicates there are lessons to learn there and we need to upscale those ambitions. We therefore need to close the ambition gap. Uh, because when we look at Aichi Biodiversity Target 12 on reducing the risk of extinction, only about fifth of the parties to the uh, CBD or Convention on Biological Diversity have national targets with a scope and level of ambition similar to the global target. And therefore nearly two thirds of the part, parties you find they are not tr on track also to meet their national targets. So that mismatch between national targets and global targets, we need to bridge that ambition and close that ambition gap. We also need to close the action gap because while most countries are taking these conservation actions as illustrated in our biodiversity outlook report, 
Of course, they are still insufficient or at insufficient scale to meaningfully reduce the rate of biodiversity loss or the rate of, uh, of extinction. And of course, we should not forget that the countries also have different challenges to be able to achieve this target 12 on, on risk of extinction in terms of lack of or limited resources, capacity, and of course the, 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 the will to really protect the species. And at national level, currently we are trying to underline or emphasize the whole of government, the whole of society. So as Asha was indicating, it, there is a danger of looking at species in isolation from other factors which have an impact on species. You cannot look at species conservation, for instance, without forest management, without agricultural management, without the national development itself and where the resources are put in for conservation. So action gap need to be, uh, to be closed. And there are quite a number of actions then which needs to be taken and upscaled to be able to close that, that gap. And for, of course, from the biodiversity context, which is key uh, for species conservation, efforts to address the direct and indirect drivers of biodiversity loss then becomes key. Mainstreaming and intersectorial integration and overall coordination in planning and implementation of biodiversity strategies, which then include conservation of species. Of course, what we also have learned from the IT biodiversity target is the need to strengthen integration of engagement of all stakeholders in conservation measures. The gender, the role of indigenous peoples and local communities, all stakeholders need to be part of the implementation uh, process. Of course, many countries develop national action plans and um, strategies and action plans. We need to strengthen those. We need them to upscale such measures and ensure really we have smart goals and targets. Learning again from IT targets moving forward, I hope by the time the post 2020 global biodiversity framework is adopted, implementation will begin immediately. With the IT targets, many countries took a step back, developed their national strategies and action plans. By the time, uh, by the time actual implementation began, we were already three, four years after the IT targets were adopted. And of course, that led to also why we have not reached uh, or met all the targets, because implementation was half a decade, not a full decade. So we hope the next framework will be the full 10 years by beginning implementation immediately. So maybe I stop there and let listen to others. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Roseanne, I can see you nodding your head. Um, what do you think is the, the big challenge we face? Sorry, your mic again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I very much agree with our, our previous speakers. Um, I agree very much with what Elizabeth said, whilst the global picture shows a very, I would say, negative picture, um, there are many, many, many local successes around the world. And that's something that was also kind of exemplified with what um, Asha is doing in Sri Lanka. And, um, and what I have to say is, yes, you know, you, you know, you see the trends and the trends are not um, going in the right uh, direction. So why are they not going in the right direction? Well, first, uh, from a global perspective, that is. Um, one, we need to recognize and understand that biodiversity is diverse. We are referring to millions of species across various taxonomic groups, from insects to mammals, to fungi, to plants, and hence having a few overriding indicators for biodiversity is in itself problematic. And the thing is, it becomes even more problematic when you try to action them on the local level, because they essentially lose their relevance. And that's why I very much subscribe to the Red List, 
because it's a great example of something that can be actionable on the local and regional level when countries and regions develop their own red list and therefore can match local priorities with action. And, um, and, 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 and through that, you can also have actions that can be measurable so that you don't have with what uh, um, uh, Asha was saying, a mismatch between global priorities and local priorities. Um, I might say something that's a little bit politically incorrect here. And so Elizabeth, please excuse me. But I do think that sometimes global indicators for biodiversity are nearly unactionable on the global level and very difficult to assess. But on the flip side, local investment and local action will actually result in global impact. More than any other issue, biodiversity crisis must be addressed at the local level and local communities must be empowered to act. And the last thing I wanna say on this issue is that biodiversity and loss and the biodiversity crisis has to be a subject of attention globally in its own right and not just a byproduct of other issues. And I'll stop there. Isn't it a temptation? We, we've got so much to talk about. Chris, I'm gonna bring you into the conversation now and, and get your sense with those years under the belt of, of how you think it's going. And at the same time, the team are flashing up what the, the public with uh, the audience have been thinking. But Chris, over to you. Sorry, you're on mute. Based on our experience, I, I think the overarching issue when it comes to rewilding, it, it's a conceptual problem. Uh, there is very little connecting rewilding in terms of increasing health and welfare of territories to climate change, the ability to um, sequester carbon as, as, as communities come back to health. There's, there's no connect, well, there's not enough connection. Conservation organizations don't focus on rewilding generally. They're focused on acquiring the territory, but in our, in our work, we see acquiring the territory as a strategy toward a fully functioning uh, ecosystem. And to have that, of course, all of you know, you have to rewild those keystone species that allow a territory to be fully functioning. I know many conservation funders who will gladly fund the acquisition of land, but they they're not interested in rewilding. They, I think a lot of people see it as a, a sort of luxury. Let's just, let's just fix the permanent conservation of these territories and then uh, let them restore on their own. That's a, that is a real conceptual problem within the philanthropic community. Mm. Um, I don't think where we have been working in many areas, I'm sorry, I have a small puppy, um, that rewilding is seen as a community economic driver. Of course, there are countries that who have, oh, I'm so sorry, who have been working on this for decades, but in many countries, while national parks can be seen as an economic driver for, for local, regional communities, rewilding itself is not. And finally, because my puppy won't stop barking, the, the possibility of some sort of global effort, really financial global effort toward the specifics of rewilding flora and fauna is really necessary. We have to move off this idea that it's just the land, it's just the territory. And that's um, pretty desperate, actually, I think. Yeah. 
Thank you, Chris, and thank you for bringing an, an animal into the discussion properly. He's he's. I apologize. He's a four-month-old puppy. He's adding his support to everything you're saying. Um, Yolanda, I, I'm going to close out the session with you and, and your thoughts and lessons that you've learned from, from your decades. Um, I, it, not being a scientist and um, dedicated more to mobilize and to public policy and to pushing agendas, um, I am convinced, Jenny and, and friends, that um, Agricultural production, food production is one of the causes. And I'm talking about the Galapagos where I'm sitting right now, where the fishery sector's impact on the Galapagos species has been enormous. And, and there is a protected area, uh, a marine area, and it's forbidden to fish for large fishes, to, um, the fish boats to get going there. But the fish don't have any walls. They move, they migrate from one place to the other, and they are caught by enormous fleets, um, uh, fisheries fleets that, that deteriorate everything and, and just catch everything they can. So food, uh, the food drivers are one of the main causes. And, and I bring this up because the reality is that one third of the food produced in this planet never reaches the consumer. So something is very wrong in us humans in trying to produce too much when it's not necessary. And that means yeah. catching too many fish or producing too many carrots. Uh, and, and that's a reality that we need to address. But then I also think it's important to, to talk about um, the, the importance of information and understanding the problem. The reality again is that the people around you don't know what we are talking about. When we use difficult words and language and scientific terminology, to describe an issue, we are not reaching the common citizen that needs to understand. They understood, for example, what would happen if bees disappeared and the importance of bees for honey. And that was easy to explain. But then every species should be dis or in risk of extinction in the red list or in danger of getting into the red list. It has a role, has a service, has a purpose in, the, in this concert of life. And if we don't let the normal citizen uh, understand, learn, and be informed about the importance of that little species or big species in, in this chain of life, they will not be actors and reactors to the risks. Then we need um, we need this battle to be fought by everybody, not only by the small community of conservationists. That is a very small community in this planet. And um, they should guide us and, and lead the way for many, many citizens to, to participate and to follow. Yesterday, I was visiting one of the islands in the, in the Galapagos and I went to a place where I had seen a blanket of sea lions, hundreds of them. Yesterday, there were less than 30. Oh. What is happening? And th that is my third point. There are lots of things we don't know of the behavior of species. And in another island where I had seen at the most five iguanas, land iguanas of these enormous reddish, greenish, yellowish iguanas. There were hundreds. So um, what are they telling us that we still don't understand? Is it climate related? Is it food related? And of course, food is related to climate. But all that wheel of um, consequences of changes 
uh, positive or negative, also have a role in many of those we don't understand. Over. Thank you. What a, a wonderful summary. You've all really given a depth to this question of, of what's going wrong. And, and I think Elizabeth was great in saying, but actually there are stories of hope as well. And, and I think certainly all of your careers show these stories of hope. But I'm gonna move not necessarily, that we did have a question on hope that I'm gonna skip over because I actually want to get to the next question of, well, what would we do about it? You know, we, we, I, I've heard such an insightful discussion around the problem and, and I'd like to turn a question rather to think about the future. Um, change will be coming, change has to come and, and we are seeing a rising awareness of, of the need for change. We're looking forward to the IUCN uh, Congress, the World Conservation Congress, sometime in 2021, one hopes, where we will all meet again and talk about how we change the world. But I, I put the question to you, if you were all powerful, if, if you were able to change something in the world, um, what would you change? What, what are the, the big things that, you know, if you were absolutely all powerful and Rosanna, I'm gonna start with you because I'm sure you are all powerful as well in a little way, but what would you do change if you could change anything? Thanks, Jenny. I mean, I'll, I, I recently, you know, we talk about hopefulness and we talk about optimism. And I just want to share with you guys um, a, a quote that I, that I heard or read recently by one of my favorite Turkish authors. And she says that it's important to have the pessimism of the mind, but the optimism of the heart and the will. And I think we talked about and we heard about these, these trends and, and we all have our understanding of why the trends are the way they are. So if I was, you know, if I had this great wand and I do have many wands because I have a four-year-old daughter that's just obsessed with sorcery and wizardry. And so um, if I did have this wand, I'll say, one of the things, you know, working in the field of conservation over the past 20 years, what's been difficult to see is that biodiversity as an issue has fallen um, with, in, in respect to being a, a priority and perhaps being overtaken by the issue of climate change. And I'm really not saying that climate change is not important. Obviously, it's an existential threat. But you know what? So is biodiversity. But to, to what I see is, and, and what I want my want to actually hit is that biodiversity is given the same sense of urge, biodiversity loss is given the same sense of urgency, publicity, and importance as climate change. But the reality is, is, is this. I, on the Google search uh, just today, I put in climate change and the return was 260 million results. I then put on the Google search biodiversity loss. And you know what? I only received 3.6 million results. So that shows you that there is this imbalance and we really need to put biodiversity um, high on the agenda, on the global agenda. The other side of the coin, of course, is when something is high on the agenda, it gets attention, but it also gets funding and financing. And we see that. So according to the Climate Policy Initiative, which is, an which is an international think tank that publishes annual funding analysis, and it says that the total climate-related financing was more than $500 billion in 2017. But then again, in comparison, on the other hand, according to the research done by OECD, um, global biodiversity finance was estimated at only 80 billion dollars per year. So I really would like to use my wand to see this imbalance being addressed. Thank you. Thank you. I see Yolanda's picking up the wand. You're now all powerful, <laughs> Yolanda. Uh, thank you, Jenny. I just want to make a comment on uh, Ratsan's first comment on, on optimism and, um, and pessimism. And, and I, I just want to share with you what is today one of my favorite bases for life. And that is a statement of Desmond Tutu, 
who someone asked him whether he was a pessimist or an optimist, and he said, I'm neither of those. I am a prisoner of hope. <laughs> And, and I think we need that. And while you're being hopeful, you do have the wand. If you were all powerful, what would you be changing? Um, I would go from the top and from the bottom. On the top, educate policy leaders. Um, the, the people at government level, national and international and institutional leaders have no idea what biodiversity is, or why is it important, or why they have to protect water, or what a species role is. And we need to educate. They, they should be uh, briefed. And, and I think that to do that, we need to create another profession. And that is the profession of interpreter of science. I remember when I was minister of the environment, uh, and I had to go to a cabinet meeting and someone gave me a 300 page document on the importance of uh, sea urchin. I'm not a scientist and I couldn't read 300 pages for a meeting that was taking place in 30 minutes. And there was no one in the ministry, and this is 20 years ago, that could summarize that document that was written in technical terms into one pager of what I needed to tell the, the president and the cabinet. That profession, that middle man or middle woman of interpreting science into policy proposals is missing. There are very few and we need to foster that. But then again, at school level, uh, children need to, as they have taught parents not to throw things out of the window of the car and plastics on the beaches, children and young people become passionate when they are, they understand the issue and we ask children to help us in, in winning the battle. So top and bottom, capacity building of those two layers of um, human society. Thank you, Yolanda. The, the magic of communication, wouldn't that be great if people could just communicate better? Yeah. Elizabeth, the, the baton, the wand is coming to you. You're all powerful. What would you change? The mute. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm saying I wish I was uh, powerful, but if I were, before I give my points, I clearly support what Rosanna was indicating. Climate change seems to have been given more attention or people talk more about it and forgetting biodiversity. But now we know clearly the, inter, the intrinsic interconnection between climate change and biodiversity. Solutions to climate change cannot be foolproof solutions without looking at Biodiversity, reversing and halting biodiversity loss. And likewise, biodiversity solutions will also contribute to climate change. Not surprising that climate change community now is talking of nature-based solutions as solutions for climate adaptation and mitigation. So clearly we need to bridge that gap. The two should not be dealt with separately. So the importance given to climate change should be the same to biodiversity since each depend on the other. So if I were, was that one powerful uh, political image and looking at uh, enhancing political will, that at policy level becomes key. COVID-19 has even taught us more in terms of how we need to rethink our relationship with nature and to consider the profound consequences of our own well, I mean, well-being and our survival that can result from the continuing loss of biodiversity. And we know at the global level, what, I mean, the greatest challenges now we face has not just been health. The health as the result of pandemic has dealt, has led to economic disaster, social disaster, environmental disaster, and developmental disaster of our time. So clearly, we must therefore ask ourselves, how can we prevent 
how can we take care of health, economic, social, environmental development, and ensure that we don't face yet another pandemic in future. So in terms of building the world and ensuring the world recovers back better, we really need to recognize also the intrinsic connection between our human health and the health and the resilience of nature. This global pandemic has reminded us of our, the negative impacts of our human actions on nature. So we have been responsible to our suffering currently, and we will be also the ones to be responsible to avoid it happening in future. So as a leader of, if I was a leader today, when we talk of economic recovery uh, from the pandemic, it should not just be recovery from the health without under putting again that connection between human health and health and the resilience of nature. We don't want to talk about what the scientists are saying has been the cause of COVID-19. It is nature. So the solutions are back in nature. So whatever we do, we have to turn back to nature and look at that relationship and our actions. So we need to restore and protect nature to ensure the integrity and advancement of human well-being which requires really transformative changes to our developmental uh, models. And this is where I repeat again, whole of government, whole of society, integrated approaches in terms of shared responsibility and global solidarity. There's no one size fits all. Individual countries cannot put, get all solutions. We know how COVID-19 has crossed borders to cover the whole world. So shared responsibility, global solidarity, collaboration, cooperation comes in. We cannot avoid. So if I have the power, I have to look at my neighbor. I have to look at my other neighbor and share those experiences to be able to work together. It really remains urgent for the global community to increase this understanding of what is exactly at stake to be able to foster the necessary actions and the needed transformations in order to achieve that level of transformation that fulfills the needs of all people, but at the same time, protecting our dear planet. We need to work, of course, hand in hand with all sectors to reinforce the political importance of biodiversity at highest level, but making the connection with climate change, with human health, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm loving the world that you, you're all talking about. Chris, I'm handing the wand to you. What, what are you doing with this all-powerful wand? Well, it's very clear that I am the one who knows the least about the inner workings of the IUCN. So I risk being wildly oversimplistic in my, my comments, but I will say this. I come from a background of being very results-driven that less talk and more action. And when I look at the IUC and what I do know about it, I would, I would recraft it into a tripod of some sort. Um, the first leg, the IUC in has, is the rock star. Who's, who's gone missing? And I agree with Yolanda that we don't know everything, but we know enough to craft real action. So the second, the second leg is how do, you, how do you turn all of that inventory of, 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 of knowledge and understanding and, and especially interesting with the complexity that we know of as biodiversity. How do you turn science into action? Because if there is science in the absence of action, then we're all sitting on our softies and twirling our thumbs. And that today is unacceptable. And I'm not talking about the IUC in, in particular, but I will say that we are so far past the point where inaction is, is acceptable. It's just not, whether it's local communities, regional, nationals, obviously starting at the individual level. So how do you turn the IUCN in 
to a machine that creates mandatory actions with timelines. And of course, we've done a lot of rewilding and we know that timelines can go completely haywire on the ground with all the th things that can happen. But we don't have any sort of global governing system that establish establishes the priorities. And Elizabeth is absolutely true, right. This has to be done at a local level, but local levels have to have the, the, the power given to them by the sovereign state. And also where is the funding come from? Because we all know that rewilding can be expensive. It's not short-term work and so on. So I would turn the IUC in, into an action machine that has the science, the knowledge, thousands of people who know exactly what's happening and probably in many cases, what to do about it. But until you're invited into the circle, until I ask you to take that and put it on the ground and do something with it, the wheels are spinning in deep mud. So I, I think changing the nature of global institutions in the absence of that i don't i don't i don't see the the level of real progress if you take the peregrine falcons and and the the as someone said earlier there's been tremendous successes in rewilding we've had a few ourselves giant anteaters and and other things where we work but it's a chain of work that requires a global respect and an understanding of the necessity of, of the work that gets done every day by a lot of dedicated people. And that chain is broken. It's chain, it, the chain of support is broken through the funding community, as I said earlier. Uh, there's lots of money out there for protecting land and and there isn't for rewilding that very territory. So there are these broken connections that are not difficult to map. They have to be very specifically gone after and conquered. And if, if global institutions like the ICU, IUCN and others don't, I think, really emphasize the the criteria and, and measuring results on the ground, I, I, I think we're missing an opportunity of a lifetime. That's what I think. Thank you, Chris. Again, such an insightful comment. Asha, I'm leaving you to close off the section and, and we certainly are talking, we could talk for hours and hours. Um, Asha, if you were all powerful, what would you change in the world? All right, I, um, I'm gonna start by saying I do agree with everything that's been said. Um, um, it's hard to disagree with those that are really valid points. Um, but from where I sit, I think one of the things I would do is make science and conservation more inclusive. Um, I think now I'm talking more from marine conservation perspective, but I do think it goes across the board. We suffer from this thing called colonial science where or col colonial conservation, where we have people from the global north come to countries like ours because we have so many problems and it's exotic. And you know, doing research and leaving or doing work and leaving without any in investment in the local infrastructure or people in capacity. Also, you know, there's this power imbalance because the funding is coming from outside, you're coming inside, you have the money, uh, it's a very uncomfortable space. Uh, you leave, you take away everything. It's a really disruptive model. It cripples conservation efforts on the ground. I myself have, this is a very personal thing that I've experienced myself. And it, I can tell you it's really frustrating, um, but it does nothing. It does nothing for our planet because it's just, to me, that model is driven by ego. It's someone who wants to be the first author on a paper. It's someone who wants to uh, be the face of a project, but it's not someone who wants to create impact on the ground. Because if you want to create impact on the ground, you would be investing in as many people as possible. Because let's be honest, if you talk about the oceans, 70% of our uh, coastlines are in the developing world. 
where's that representation at the global stage, right? Where are those people from those coastlines? Why are they not sitting at these tables making decisions with us, right? Or, or, or you know, why is it that oftentimes I find myself being one of the only people there, right? Speaking for 70% of the planet, we're not gonna have success. Right, so if we truly want to save our oceans, every coastline needs a local hero, and that's my thing. Local heroes are not, I'm not talking about people with PhDs or degrees, they are people who are passionate, who live in these spaces, who are on the ground, who can identify a problem when it comes up, who can come up with locally relevant solutions. Because if we're not coming up, and this goes back to my previous point, right, blanket solutions don't work, we should know that by now. Right, so it's really being able to tailor make and to know what's happening here. How do I? How do we solve it on the ground? But as long as we allow this model of colonial science, we love to think colonialism is a thing of the past, but it's not. It manifests itself in various ways. As long as we allow that to happen, it's going to continue to derail our progress. And I think COVID nineteen. I think it's you know a, a really good example of um a, you know I, I mean as you know this pandemic started. I was listening to my colleagues who typically will fly across the world to do research and to do conservation work, complaining about the fact that, you know, there's a gaping hole in my data. Uh, this year, we won't be able to do much work on the ground. And, and my response was, look, you know what? Like, if you had an equal partnership with people on the ground, if you accept, accept that it's a two-way process, yes, sure, you build some capacity, but they have a lot to offer on the, from the ground, right? As locals, I mean, I know the lay of the land much better than someone who comes from outside. Humility, listening, that's what I want more of in conservation. And I would say that if we had built these equal partnerships, you wouldn't have gaping holes in your data set, right? This year wouldn't be lost. For, I mean, I, I'll use myself in, as an example. You know, between our first lockdown and our second lockdown, I was able to immediately get, you know, research assistants across the island collecting data on the impact of the pandemic on small scale fisheries. The only reason I could do that is because I was here. The minute it opened up and it was safe, I could hire people and send them out, right? So we, we can respond to urgent needs as well. And I think the reality is that our current model is, hasn't worked. Business as usual hasn't. If 70% of our planet is o the oceans, we need at least you know, half the world working for the oceans, right? We need armies. And sometimes, you know, maybe that's not the best word, but we need to build everyone up, empower everybody, give them the trust and believe that everyone has a role to play and really start to disrupt the current system because otherwise, we're not going to be successful. Thank you. This is just absolutely such a riveting discussion. Um, I do want to give Razan some time and, and Razan hand to you because you are running as president of IUCN in, in the upcoming elections. And just to give you a platform for a few minutes to just share with us your vision of, of what you would do if you were successful. And I know you've got Yolanda sitting next to you who's done this before, but handing the platform over to you for a few minutes. So first of all, uh, Jenny, let me start by just saying that I am in awe um, with everybody on this panel. I mean, everyone individually is somebody that I hold and I follow and I am totally inspired by. And everything that has been said in this panel is extremely relevant to the future of IUCN. I'll focus on a few themes that's been said and it's something that I very much would commit to should I be elected as president. But really what Asha said empower, empower, empower. The issues that are facing biodiversity are the same challenges that were pinpointed at the advent of the conservation movement. These issues happen at the local level and therefore must be addressed at the local level. And we must empower local communities to address, address those issues. You know, we talk about the need for scaling up Absolutely, and IUCN is in a very good position to help support scaling up these efforts so that people like Elizabeth at the CBD can see the effects of global efforts, I mean, local efforts on the global scale. But essentially, what I would hope to achieve is something that I've been very frustrated about and really this need to elevate biodiversity loss as an existential challenge on the global agenda. And I really think that IUCN is well-placed to do so. But to do so, we need to be more active 
we need to be more effective advocates for nature conservation globally. We need IUCN, we can all agree about this, we need IUCN now more than ever, when the fabric of our existence, which is biodiversity, is being threatened. But we need an IUCN that is fit for purpose. The world is changing. Things are moving very, very fast. We can't be the only ones that are walking in a race. We need to move, we need to move faster, and we need to be, as, as, as Chris said, action-oriented. How? I would focus on three Cs. One, concentration. Focus on the niche of IUCN, which is nature conservation. We need to continue to develop, to innovate our knowledge products and make those available for local communities, not just the products themselves, but also the expertise. Local communities, as Asha knows, have a lot of knowledge to share, and they need those networks to empower them to act. The second thing we need to do is really redesign our internal poli policies and processes that, so that we are able to streamline our work to better serve our members and to be able to better respond to externalities. We talked a lot about communications, and that's really my second C. We need to communicate. We cannot only, we need to communicate widely and not only to our peers to reassert our position as the world's leading authority on conservation. We tend to, as conservationists, continue to talk to like-minded individuals. We need to enlarge our circles. And by enlarging our circles, we need to also be open to criticism. And finally, we need to collaborate. We need to collaborate with other global players we need to collaborate with other institutions. We need to make sure that we do not compete with the fabric of what makes IUCN really great, which are its members, and we need to empower our youth. Our youth have incredible innovations. They have incredible ideas, and we need to empower our youth. We need to empower indigenous communities to really bring forward a new vision for nature conservation that is globally and locally relevant. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Razan, and, and good luck with your, your ambitions. For Reverse the Red, we are a, a new organization, and it's not even an organization. We're a, a coalition, a movement, a group of willing partners coming together. We will be hosting a pavilion at the IUCN World Conservation Congress, and I would really love to book all of you in for a follow-up discussion, because I think we're just scratching the surface of, of what we, we really want to move. I love the themes that have come through because Reverse the Red is all about partnerships. It's about communication and about empowering communities to do better. Um, it's about using the tools of assess, plan, and act in interesting ways. And we're starting to work on bringing together a couple of pilot countries to show how the model might work and how we might be able to really train up more people. Um, Asha, I loved your goal. Our, our goal is let's train as many people as possible in the science of conservation and saving species. We have a new website that is live, and if you'd like to know more about who we are and what we're doing, you can access the website. And, and the main thing we're doing is building global partnerships. And I really would like to shout out a thanks to Smithsonian who've been hosting these webinars, giving us a platform to talk to HHMI, which is a, um, a media partner that have been working with us and helping us with the website and telling our stories and made that amazing video that we saw at the beginning. To the San Diego Zoo, who've been working on case studies, you'll find case studies of hope that share how you can assess, plan and act and make a difference. Uh, the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums who are involved in linking 700 million people who visit us. And so we see zoos as places and aquariums as places of education and communication to share these stories. And the awesome SSC team who make everything work. They really are a joy to work with and John Paul runs an incredible organization. And I know in the background, he's been busy answering questions that have been going on. And we'll certainly share the transcripts and the chat with all of you. I, I know I've done a horrible job of chairing because I was so engrossed in the conversation and we've run over by 10 minutes. Um, but I wanted to give you each one final word. And if you all promise to do it really quickly, I'm going to go around the room and say, 
last thing you'd love to share with all of us. Um, Chris, let me start with you and your wonderful puppy. <laughs> okay, three points. I agree completely, and we work this way. Local people are the way that you get rewilding done on the ground. Not only the people working on the ground with the individual species, but the communities around these areas are essential to any measure of success. Two, I think, uh, as I said earlier, the IUCN being much more results driven, and this requires money, it requires uh, a shift perhaps in the, in the conceptual framework for it, and it requires speed, as we know, for rewilding and, and uh, have a success in one place and then move on. And finally, there has to be some sort of award system for rewilding that comes with the Nobel Prize. I'm always trying to change the nature of peace, the concept of peace. And so I'm chipping away at that. And I hope all of you receive the Nobel Prize eventually for your work between peace and the non-human world, a uh, human and non-human world, that's it. Oh, I love that. The Nobel Prize for saving species. Uh, Elizabeth, your final word for everyone. Difficult for one word. Uh, in the context of the CBD work, of course, for me now is looking forward to getting this, what everybody says, uh, ambitious, transformative post 2020 global biodiversity framework. So getting it is one because it's just a paper, a document, but really to have it implemented and not implemented top down, but implemented bottom up. This is where we need to get on the ground action. But to get the on the ground action, as Asha was saying, we need to get those local, local community, the farmers on the negotiation table, being consulted as governments are making their positions, are making their policy interests to get them on board, because that's the only way we will ensure them participating in the implementation. If we succeed in that, it means we will also succeed in reaching the 2030 Agenda Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 SDGs, because 14 of them depend on contribution from biodiversity. And that will include also climate change uh, response. So again, that getting back to the interconnection of all these issues. Thank you. Uh, Yolanda, last word. I think we need to link um, conservation and species and extinction to something that is very close to us, the humans. For example, I would link it to health uh, and build a relationship about health of the environment, health of the planet, and health of humans. There is no healthy human being in an unhealthy planet. So that link needs to be built, I think, and then we will have thousands of citizens joining us in, the, in preserving biodiversity. Thank you. Asha. Um, so I, I would say, I think, um, I think we have the power amongst us and I think I'm a, um, I believe in the goodness of humanity to drive change. So for that to happen, I think we need to all grow in humility, become better listeners, uh, recognize that there are the people around us who can, who have a lot to offer um, in these situations to help us move forward and progress. And I also hope that we can all become better storytellers because I think the more we start to share the magic of these incredible spaces, we are the privileged ones. That's what we have to recognize. I'm privileged. I get to sit on boats and watch the largest animal that's ever roamed the planet. And I must remember that and take the responsibility of then bringing those stories back 
to everyone so that we can engage everyone in the magic of our world's oceans. Thank you. And Rosanne, last word for you. Very last word. <laughs> I mean, you know, COVID perhaps is giving us a chance to build back better. And it's also given us a chance to recognize the, the importance of science. And so we need to be able to speak science to power. And at the same time, we cannot just leave the, con uh, leave the conservation responsibility to, on the shoulders of conservationists. We need to mainstream and democratize the issue um, and the challenge of biodiversity loss. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been such a wonderful discussion. I am really sad it has to come to an end. Um, I would like to remind us all and everyone that we are powerful, that each and every single one of us is powerful and we make choices every day. We choose who we vote for, we choose what we buy and we choose what we do with our time and our energy and our resources. And it makes a difference. And, and Elizabeth spoke so powerfully early on about how we can make a difference, how we can change the outcomes. And we can do it mostly when we work together and when we make this commitment to meeting targets, the commitment to action that Chris spoke about, um, and, and this commitment to speaking to everyone, bringing local communities and bringing people along with us. Um, any of us who, when you lose hope, all you need to do is talk to some children um, and talk about the future and their views and their visions are still incredibly inspiring and insightful. So thank you all holding yourselves, holding your country and holding your companies that you deal with to account is what we need to be doing. So we look forward to keeping this discussion going. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, today to this morning, wherever we are. Um, it's been a wonderful opportunity and I really look forward to carrying on the conversation with all of you as we progress with reversing the trends for redless species. Thank you so much. <laughs>